Good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are watching this from. Um, I'm going, my, um, my name is Martin Beebe. Uh, I'm head of the Advanced Avionics Systems at uh, Consonova. And I'm going to be talking briefly about uh, data coupling and control coupling analysis for highly critical software. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Consonova is a uh, company of CVEs and DERs who can provide uh, training, engineering support, and compliance services. So many people, uh, when they read the guidance documentation, don't necessarily understand clearly what data coupling and control coupling is and why it's important. Uh, we have, uh, in the past, we had uh, the uh, CAST papers that helped on some of these topics. And the definitions uh, that they provide are on the on the slide and what they the real concern is here is that wherever you have a flow of data or a flow of execution between software components there is some relationship between those components that may change behavior if that relationship is not maintained so um, we need to also un understand what it is that DO178C or ED12C is really concerned about. And what is really needed by the guidance is that we have um, requirements-based tests that verifies the intended function of the software is implemented. And as part of that, we use structural coverage as a way of measuring the effectiveness or completeness of our tests. And the data coupling and control coupling analysis is really just an extension of that structural coverage to make sure that all of the data flows and control flows that, that we have in our design and our implementation are fully exercised by those requirements-based tests to make sure that the way the relationships we defined in our design are properly carried through into the implementation and then exercised by the testing. So the objective associated with this can be or needs a number of different ways of uh, satisfying this. So within the architecture of our software, we need to review and analyze that architecture to make sure that we have a complete uh, and consistent uh, definition of all the data flows and, con and control flows. When we review and analyze our source code, we need to make sure that those uh, data flows and control flows defined in the design are, um, are put correctly into the implementation, but also that any um, additional uh, data flows and control flows that are inherent in the way that the source code is written are fully understood. And then finally, and this is really the key part that often gets missed, is we need to make sure that all of our requirements-based tests are designed to exercise those, interf um, those implemented um, data flows and control flows. So I mentioned that we define these data flows and control flows within the architecture. Um, it's also important to understand that, that what we design or what we put in our design may only be a subset of what is actually implemented in the source code. And we can really simplify this problem by within our design standards and coding standards, making sure that we have standardized mechanisms for um, managing the flow of data between components and maybe even uh, managing the scheduling or flow of control through, through the software. And these standardized mechanisms can make it much easier to uh, ensure that what was in the design ends up in the source code and any analysis much easier. So we can see from, from this, this diagram that we have through the call of, of one module to another, we have a control coupling. And if we have a similar uh, um, call that passes per, uh, parameters, 
that gives us a data coupling. So we can see very clearly that actually the sequence with which we implement our, our calls will influence um, the flow of uh, data in terms of functionality by making sure that it appears at the right time. So we need to make sure that however we have designed this flow of data and flow of control, that is actually what gets implemented. And within our tests, we exercise these for normal and robustness conditions to make sure that actually we have fully exercised all of this and made sure there is no anomalous behavior. So one of the key aspects with this objective is really what is the evidence that we need to demonstrate that we have um, performed this effectively and particularly for very critical systems uh, we need very clear evidence that we have completely covered all data flows and control flows and actually we can use the uh, concept of of traceability and extend that in a very very simple way to make sure that that actually we can indeed um, effectively show complete coverage through our uh, tests. So very simply put, we uh, can actually identify unique tags for, for each uh, data flow or control flow that uh, is identified within the architecture. We can then uh, extend that by looking at the uh, source code and identifying any additional data flows or control flows that exist within in the implementation, giving us a complete list of tags that cover all of the data flows and control flows within our source code and our design. And we need to be careful when we think about this, is, and, and this is also where um, uh, standards can, can help us because depending on what we have in our um, what we have in our coding standards, we may very easily identify or include a number of, of data flows through assignments and so on that, that may not be obvious simply by reading the um, uh, uh, reading the source code. So some um, analysis, careful analysis of the source code will be needed to make sure that we've got every single uh, data flow within the source code. And similarly, for our uh, control flows, if we are using um, pointers and so on, we need to make sure that, that um, we fully identify all potential um, uh, 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 flows that are uh, implemented with pointers. So finally, we can end up with a series of um, data flows and control flows that we can construct into a traceability matrix very much as we would with requirements. But at this point, we're only looking at the um, data flows and the control flows and really identifying um, in terms of control flow or data flow exactly uh, what each component within the software is actually doing. And then once, once we have those, we can then identify the requirements that are related to those particular data flows and control flows. And this should be fairly straightforward because the data flows and control flows are there for a reason. They're there to support some functionality which will be expressed in terms of requirements, which we have requirement tags for. So this is where we start to link our two forms of uh, traceability. Then once we know what um, requirements are there for each data flow or control flow, we can then look at the associated test cases and then we can review those test cases with the view to ensuring that each of the data flows and control flows I identified actually truly exercise um, those, those data flows and control flows. 
So that's what we're looking to do here is not only identify the test cases, but then review the test cases to make sure that they, they truly exercise the data flows and control flows. And we need to remember too, that actually we can only do this um, on our uh, um, integrated software components. Because we are looking at data flows and control flows between the software components, we have to do this with an integrated um, test. And like all uh, coverage analysis, we will find issues. And for each of those issues, we will need to identify some kind of uh, resolution. And it depends what, what the issues is. It may be that, that actually we find data flows and control flows that aren't documented in the architecture, but are implemented in the source code. And maybe there's a deficiency in the, in the architecture we might find data flows and control flows that aren't really needed to support the requirements or data flows and control flows that are not exercised by the test. So this can yield uh, potential errors within the design that should be removed. So it's a very similar process to structural coverage in terms of identifying anomalies and then uh, resolving those and, and also like structural coverage, we need to reach the 100% coverage metric in order to say that we are, are complete. So that's all, all well and good for fairly uh, simple software, but we can also use this same technique to cover more complex software. So if we have an environment such as an IMA or a multi-core environment, we can actually uh, extend this by, by looking at data flows and, and control flows between uh, components at a different level. Okay, so maybe we have multiple software components on a single platform or on a single processor, and we're looking at uh, um, the coupling between those components. We can take the same process of identifying those data flows and those control flows, tagging them, associating them with related requirements, and making sure that we have sufficient tests for each level of integration to show that actually we're exercising all of these data flows and control flows and finding any anomalous behavior. So while this isn't a particularly uh, radical approach, um, what, what I've presented is a fairly uh, um, systematic approach uh, using a very simple analysis technique that can really simplify an objective that isn't always understood properly. And by understanding this properly, this can also help us improve our, our design standards, our coding standards, and ultimately lead to um, uh, much better and much safer implementations. And I've also shown that actually the same technique can be extended to cover more highly integrated and complex environments. And this is always, wherever we have these kinds of an analyses, it always leads us to identifying ways in which we can simplify our designs and our implementations to ultimately reduce errors. Okay. So, uh, thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for watching. Um, I hope you found it, it useful. Um, please feel free to uh, contact Consonova if you have any questions on the presentation at all. Many thanks.